Are we live already? Yes. We are live. Hi. Okay. We are live. I can see. I cannot see. It's just so on. Eh? I can only see myself. We're going to start at 2.30. Okay, we have people joining us. So give us a while and we will start at 2.30. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday afternoon. We're waiting for our guest. Oh, Tatian is in the room. Thanks for coming. Yeah, more and more people are joining us. We're going to start very, very soon. Luis, are you ready? I'm ready. Can, can you see my face or you will just see the, the share screen, the empty uh, screen? I see your wallpaper. Okay, so I can't get the image. It's okay. No worries. Okay, I think that's Shall okay. Shall we just, yeah. yeah, let's start then. All right. So, okay, uh, today is our um, first episode, you can say, but it's not exactly the first because we have done our bid and ask uh, interview series um, probably a couple of years ago, right? Uh, just that we have a long hiatus and uh, I uh, think that it's time to uh, activate this again since uh, we are quite used to doing a lot of all these uh, webinars uh, during the COVID-19 period. So uh, we, we believe that um, we can continue to uh, do such interview series and the difference is that we're going to do it live. So you can see that we were stumbling a little bit uh, here and there because uh, we are not familiar with Facebook Live and uh, we had to use uh, Zoom to fit it in. But no worries, uh, we will get better over time. And today, my guest uh, is Louis. All right, he's one of the co-founders of Dr. Well. I've known him for many years. And uh, initially, when uh, I started this company, I, I uh, asked a few of them, and Louis was one of them. And uh, they were very kind uh, and uh, determined and disciplined enough to build this business together over the years. And he himself uh, started off as an engineer in the oil and gas industry. And uh, in mid, not, not really a mid-career, he seemed for you to being a financial advisor, right? As well as a advisor, it's a, 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 a dual license kind of representative, all right? And uh, he has done very early, uh, his past five years of his journey as an advisor, karma remiser. He started from scratch and uh, now he has uh, over $20 asset under uh, advisory. All right. So uh, this is an uh, achievement that probably a lot of advisors would also like to have. And now he also have a team of advisors that's under him. So it is. It has been a tremendous uh, journey. So I wanted to ask him, right, because he met over like uh, almost 2,000 clients over the years and uh, he probably seen a lot of uh, money problems, common ones that people are, are committing to it. So we thought that uh, we could get him to share some of this, right? So uh, probably we, let's start off with the first question. Right? Let's rewind a little bit uh, right. back to... Uh, your journey, okay. Uh, what made you want to switch your career, right? Or in guess to financial advisory. Why did you make that decision? All right. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Alvin, for uh, arranging this uh, session. Uh, I I was when I graduated from uni, right? I actually uh joined uh offshore and marine uh, industry, okay. Uh, because at the time I have no idea about financial planning, about investment, right? So. Uh, and of course, uh, as a fresh grad, what you need is just a fixed income. So I actually get uh, into the company to, to become an engineer, right? And I've been working there for four and a half years, right? And throughout that four and a half year, I actually uh, learned that I need to grow my money. Okay? I cannot just work and just, just to get an active income without uh, managing my, growing my wealth, 
right? So uh, in the four years, I actually picked up a lot of knowledge on my own. Okay, I actually uh, completed my CFA during that four and a half years, right? And then I realized that a lot of people, a lot of friends actually come to ask me, hey, how do you do your investment? Okay, how to plan your finance? Okay, how, how, what kind of insurance you are getting for, to cover yourself? Okay, and since there are so many of them actually ask me about financial advice, then I actually uh, asked myself, hey, why not I get a license? Uh, I, I want to uh, provide a proper advice instead of just um, uh, give uh, advice uh, without going to the, uh, using the, the, the actual the, the financial industry knowledge. Uh, right? So yeah, so that's why I want to uh, join. I want to join as a, a financial planner. Uh, and because at the time, I, it's uh, my first time that I want to change the career. Okay, in fact, it's my first time to change job at that time. Uh, then I just asked around, hey, should I become a financial planner? So, uh, of course, uh, I actually posted on Facebook. You can see on this slide. Uh, it, it's a real uh, post I posted on 201, in 2013. Uh, and I just asked, should I become a financial planner? And you can see that the comment from the friend and uh, some, I think, is a uh, relative, uh, uh, not really a good comment, okay, I would say. Uh, I, I think financial planner is not really a like, grammarous uh, work that people talk of. Uh, we really have to face a lot of rejection. And when you, when you hand over your card to your friend, family member, they see your name card is financial planner. They'll say, they say, oh, insurance agent. Or you sell, me, you sell insurance, huh? Yeah. So this kind of a, uh, a image will appear, right? That's why I just delayed for two years. You can see the post was in 2013. And I really started the journey in actually 2015 after two years, okay? Because I realized that I cannot just follow my friend's uh, advice or comment and uh, based on their comment and determine my life, okay? And actually, I watched this uh, very old movie, okay? It's called The Pursuit of Happiness. I think just, you can just Google, you can find some uh, website to watch this as well, okay? And the quote, uh, I'm not sure that whether it's a real quote or real story, Okay, but it actually triggered me to want to make the change. Okay, uh, the quote say that you cannot let someone uh, tell you that you cannot do something. Okay, if they cannot do anything themselves, they are going to tell that they cannot. Uh, you cannot do it as well, right? So if you have your dream that you want to go for it, uh, you must really fight for it. Okay, don't listen to others. Yeah, so that actually triggered me to make a change. Okay, and actually become a financial planner in two zero one five. And I tell them, I, 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 tell, I told myself I must be professional, okay? Uh, that's why I pick up more and more knowledge like uh, financial, uh, certified financial planner program. So they have a more holistic view about uh, financial planning uh, knowledge. And since then, uh, I follow my first supervisor in my career. He told me that, hey, you must meet at least one person per day, right? And this become my golden rule from day one. And I try to meet at least one person a day, right? To do the financial planning, right? I, and 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 do I do have some uh, like template to do a proper financial planning? Uh, talk about the more holistic approach, right? And yeah, that's why you can see that I meet I have met more than about twenty two thousand clients because if you talk about average per year, it's about three hundred sixty five multiple five years. That is about one thousand five. And sometimes I meet two or three people per day, right? That is how I meet all these uh, people. All right. Yeah. So, so, I, so I hear some, that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, we all know that because there's always this social stigma with a financial advisor, right? And and you it took you a while before uh you even accepted it yourself, right? Yep. And uh, you also mentioned that uh the the movie the pursuit of happiness was a pivotal point to help you decide, but I don't think yep. it's just a movie alone, right? So it could be probably a confluence of factors that. Uh, led you to uh, decide that this is the path despite all the negativity that was thrown at you. Yes, of course, of course. Definitely will not just because of movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Did your, like, your spouse you know, support you in, uh, in your decision and things like that? Were there people around you that were supportive, right? even though most were not? Uh, okay, at that time, I was still a uh, single. Right? I'm not married yet. I've got a girlfriend at that time. Uh, but the good thing for, for me and my so-called girlfriend at the time that we don't have a lot of commitment, we don't have a lot of liabilities. So uh, even with our saving, we can last uh, for ourselves for the next few years, right? So I, I didn't tell anyone when I really joined. Okay? Even my family member, until now, probably they still don't know what I'm doing. 
because <laughs> it's a uh, it, it, it's a something uh, not so close to them, right? So I don't really ask my family member when I train the the job, lah, right? Uh, of course, right now they they see that I'm quite successful, so called. So they are quite happy for me. Uh, and you know when I there's also one story I want to share is when I got my degree in engineering, right? Uh, I got a first class honor. So so. Uh, a lot of people tell me, hey, uh, you should not join offshore and marine. You should join a uh, bank because bank will make big money for you. Okay, that was when I first joined uh, in my offshore and marine uh, company for first, I think mean, two days only. Someone tell me, hey, you should not come here. You should go to the bank. Right? And then four, five years later, when I quit the engineering job, I joined the financial industry. And then two days later, someone actually told me, hey, you have a good degree, like engineering degree. You should go to work in engineering degree uh, industry. Yeah. So see, if we just follow our, I mean, other people' advice or view, I mean, they'll just point you to somewhere that they like to go into, right? So, uh, since then, I will never follow my other friend or family advice to let them decide what should I do in my life, right? Yeah. So I'm very determined on this part. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's a good point, right? Because um, when we can't decide on something, especially major things in our lives, we always like to ask for opinions. And uh, sometimes um, the opinions can, uh, it's just a reflection of their personal views, right? And they, and they may not be really what you want. The context may be also very different, uh, going in different directions in lives. So, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes also commit uh, that kind of uh, indecision. Uh. So, um, it's, it's easily that, uh, really that strong focus uh, of, what you really want in life uh, is a lot more important. Uh, easy to say, but very hard to do. Right? Yeah. So I'm glad that uh, you made that choice and stuck to it and uh, you're uh, quite successful by now. All right, uh, a good story to tell. And uh, of course, not easy. And let's m maybe move on to um, the more practical part and uh, aspect of uh, yeah. financial planning, right? So you met so yeah. many, like almost 2,000 yeah. clients. So you, yeah. uh, you told me that uh, there are like five good lessons, even more, right? But probably we just talk about five, lah. Okay. Sure, so sure, maybe we yeah, start sure. with start with the first one, right? What is the most common problem, money problem you see among your clients? Okay. Uh, for this uh sharing, uh, I, I really just prepare a few uh slide, lah. Okay. Uh, just to remind me, uh, what should I uh, present, lah? right? So uh, of course there are many money problems that uh we I, I personally uh see uh when I meet with uh, my client. Okay, uh, I, I definitely will not mention their name, okay, because those are confidential, right? But uh, in general, uh, what I see usually is most, uh, this is one of the, probably the first problem I see is a lot of them actually, they don't have proper financial planning, okay? Uh, they usually use those uh, short-term saving for long-term investment, okay? Sometimes maybe you need to like buy a house in one or two years time, but they go and invest in like stock. Okay, because they heard that, hey, this stock can make money. Okay, you have their friends made a lot of money in these stocks. So if they just go ahead and invest the capital into uh, stocks or, or something that requires to hold for long term. Okay, and that actually trigger uh, a problem. Okay, uh, they have low or no holding power. Okay, especially during this period, COVID-19 period, uh, a lot of uh, uh, clients actually forced to sell their holding because they worry that the market cannot recover in, in, in time for them to liquidate their holding and take out the money that they need for uh, for certain purpose, okay? Yeah, so that actually one of the main problems I see because most of them, they don't really plan properly, okay? They have cash in the bank, they just put money in stocks and then they just hope that the stock will move up immediately, okay? But that, that is not right, okay? And also uh, weak cash flow and long wrong investment allocation. Uh, if you follow proper financial planning strategy, right? If you have uh, so-called shorter term uh, period, you, you should not go into high risk investment. Okay, you should go into low set, uh, with low risk or medium risk, and give you certainty of uh, income or payout. Okay, at the end of the duration holding period. Yeah, so that is one of the most common problem that I see. Right, okay, a lot so, of them so, don't plan properly. So you are <laughs> saying that um, if, like for example, I want to buy a house in two years time, right? Mm. Uh, but then uh, I have I have a sum of um, deposit that's supposed to be uh, uh, paid 
for the house they're going to buy in two years time, maybe set aside like a uh, hundred thousand dollars, right? But then I felt that it's yeah. very wasteful if I just put hundred thousand dollars in a bank for two years, I earn not much interest. So let's look for something that's higher yielding, right? Then maybe I go and yeah. look at the stock market and say, you know, the stock market, wow, every year they say you can make ten percent or nine percent or seven percent. It's much much better than where I put in a bank. So then I put inside the stock mm. market. Then two years later, uh, then market. Market do well, correction, okay, or whatever, yeah. right? Then I mm-hmm. need the money, so I have to sell my investment, then uh, pay for the deposit in the house. But probably by then I left with seventy thousand instead of the original one hundred thousand. Is that the yeah. common thing you see? Yes, yes, that that is one of the common thing I see. Yeah. So, but what uh, what would the, be your advice mm-hmm. for them if let's say they haven't really invested this hundred thousand dollars that they set aside for whatever financial plans that they have in the near future? Well, if you're talking about one or two years time, I don't even want you to invest the money. You should look for something that gives you guaranteed return. Uh, of course, in the industry right now, uh, of probably less than two years, you won't, you won't really find a good uh, instrument to give you a good return uh, because your horizon is uh, too short, right? Uh, but it's okay. I mean, if, if that two years later, that objective, let's say to buy a house is a top priority, you should protect this capital. Okay, you should protect this capital and should not aim for high return, right? So, uh, part aside into fixed fee, even Singapore saying, well, I know the return is low, okay? But your objective uh, is to get the money out, okay? Must get the money out within two years. So, you should go into something that's low risk and give you certainty of a payout. Yeah, so I don't even want you to invest the money, which a yes. lot of people, they don't, they don't force, they don't, they don't lose this kind of planning and allocation. Okay, because generally people yeah. don't think that bad things will happen to them. Correct. So it's always yeah. like blue sky scenario. I'm putting my money to work. But if they really need the money in the short term, then uh, something that's more capital guaranteed will be more important. Uh, like what you mentioned would be like SSB. So which is the priority mm. is not about investment gain, but to protect the capital that you need in one, two years time. Right. Yep. W- would you like even suggest things like uh, fixed D for two years or even things like um, how about money market fund for two years? Is that even sound? Uh, yeah, these two will be more closer to the risk that the person can take. Uh, of course, fixed D definitely is capital guaranteed by the bank. Uh, money market fund, if you look at the underlying holdings, is about 70, 80% into fixed D and also short-term bond. So uh, also as safe as fixed D, of course, they won't say it's capital guaranteed, but these two definitely is more suitable for the person that need the amount in short term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, again, it's easy to say, but very hard to do, right? Because uh, yeah. when someone sees the cash lying around and not doing much, they, they always have the urge that, you know, I need to invest this. I need to get a higher return. Otherwise, I'm not doing work. I'm not doing enough, right? Uh, so I yeah. guess the human behavior part is, is uh, uh, what probably even financial advisors find it hard to, <laughs> hard to shape along the way. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think this is also, uh, I mean, in my practice also, uh, have to propose this kind of allocation to my client where they, I just ask them, hey, can you just don't invest this amount because you need the money in two years. But the rejection I always face, hey, the return is so low. Why not I first buy REITs or buy some bond or buy blue chip, right? Or get four or 5% dividend yield. I always receive this kind of a, a, a so-called a, a rejection. Yeah, yeah, correct. That why why I want to find the fixed fee where the return is so low. But they always forget to look at the downside risk of these instruments. And only until this year, probably they face it. They, they see the, the situation that equity is actually not risk-free. Yeah. Mm, okay. So I, I don't know whether you have the percentage, like um, uh, for clients who have this first problem, right? After mm. even you told them about the risk, how many percentage of them still just go ahead and take the risk anyway? Do you even have this number? Just a rough um, sense. I can't really quantify because honestly, I can uh, provide my advisor advice, but eventually how they do it is really out of my control, you see. Right? Uh, unless I help them to put into fixed D, but I'm not from banks, so I can't do that. So I can propose that hey, you can transfer some fund to money market fund, but eventually it's still up to them to decide what they, they want to do with the money. Yeah. So I suppose that um, it's the minority uh, that will actually follow what you advise them. Uh, for this kind of short term, yeah. yeah. kind of short term saving, yes, okay. yeah. 
Okay. So that is a common problem. If you mm. have this problem, please think twice. All right. Uh, about what we shared just now. How about we go to the second one? Okay. Uh, second one. Uh, oh, this one is more about protection. Okay. Uh, they are underinsured or have uh, inadequate insurance plans. I think this is really more common than the first one. <laughs> uh, because when you know when you talk about insurance, the first uh, rejection you face is, oh, I got it. I have already. I bought a few years ago. Enough. I got enough. I don't talk about insurance to me anymore. Okay, because I have. I got something uh, back then in maybe 10 years ago, right? So, uh, and also they say that, hey, I'm paying too much premium. Okay, uh, but they don't realize that insurance is something that they need to review almost like every year or every few years. Uh, and they should have a proper uh, analysis, uh, proper planning, and see how much should be the sufficient coverage. Okay, and not just about the premium. Okay. Uh, the 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 coverage must be adequate, okay. And then what type of insurance they need to so called cover the protection needs? Uh, that is the uh, the other question. Okay, which means whether they want to use a term plan or life plan. That is the other question. Okay, that will decide whether high or low premium. Okay, but the first thing they need to do is to do a a review, see whether they have sufficient coverage or not. Okay, that actually come under uh, we call I call wealth protection strategy, uh, because. When for a person to reach financial freedom, before they reach financial freedom, they need to protect what they have. Okay, and that they have two things which is most important to them. One is of course their capital, which is the money in the bank or investment. They should protect that. And secondly, is their own earning powers. Okay, uh, so these two are we call human capital and financial capital that the person need to protect. Uh, yeah, for for the by using the insurance plan. Okay, and uh. Yeah, and, and there's one last one I think a lot of people miss out is you need to have insurance summary. Uh, don't don't look don't think that this insurance summary is, is like useless, it's just an Excel table or what. Okay, uh, it's something that you must have not only for yourself, but for your close one, like your spouse or sibling or parents to know what you have. Okay, this is very important because in the event of any like quicker illness or hospital happen, you are not the one to claim. Okay, it's your loved one that claim for you. It's your loved one that talk to the insurance company or insurance advisor to tell them that, hey, my husband or my boyfriend or my, my sibling got problem. Okay, how, uh, should, uh, which one can I claim, right? So a lot of people, they miss out this. Uh, I have a one real story. Okay, uh, uh, the, the, the client uh, father, so-called, uh, got a stroke. Got a stroke. And I think the father is quite savvy in finance. So uh, he does all the... Uh, insurance planning for the entire family and including himself and then he never share this summary or planning to anyone in the family member and now the father got stroke so the children come to me hey can you tell me which one can i claim for my father uh then i ask them so what what are the insurance plan that your father has they say i don't know All right then i have no choice because i don't even know what the plan that the father has Right. So I just ask them, you have to call every single insurance company, right? check with them uh, whether your father has bought any plan with the insurance company. Yeah. So you have to call everyone you know, because you don't know which company you have the insurance plan. You know? All right. And I think you can go to, I think, LIA website. You can see many unclaimed policy. Right? Uh, so it's very important to have an adequate insurance plan and the proper insurance company uh, summary and share this with your close one. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good point, right? So insurance summary is not for yourself, right? Uh, because beneficiaries don't even know it exists, how are they going to claim yep. on behalf of you, especially when you are not around anymore or you are incapacitated to a certain extent. So that's a, that's an important part and you need to communicate that. Um, and on that uh, point 2A, right? You mentioned too high premium, too low coverage. Um, uh, Usually, what kind of uh, uh, policies or scenarios they ended up in this uh, kind of uh, uh, situation? Oh, okay. Uh, very simple. Uh, if, they, if they do proper insurance planning, right, the first thing they should get is those like hospitalization plan. Okay, that one to me is a must. Uh. Then the next thing, of course, they must look at whether they need a, a quicker illness or death coverage. Okay, that should come from either a term plan or life plan or maybe hybrid uh, of the term and life plan. Okay, but a lot of them, uh, when they go to a certain financial institution, okay, I don't want to mention what kind of institution, right? Then the, the person, okay, that the staff that tell them that hey, you need this saving plan. 
you need this because you put you put money in the bank um in the financial institution will get very low return so you should put into this plan that give you higher return and that's ended up with some so-called endowment plan or saving plan which they pay a lot of premium but not for coverage it's for saving okay and that should not be the first thing they should get when talk about insurance planning okay the first thing they should get is more on coverage not on saving value okay yeah so that is why some of them when they come to me wow how come you pay so much premium and then we look at the summary that they have or the insurance policy that they have uh, realize that they have maybe multiple or saving plan and there's no so-called term insurer or maybe don't don't even have hot special insurance yeah then of course as a financial planner of course i'll suggest that hey now you have lack of this protection okay i suggest you take up this term plan or this hospitalization plan and the rejection they give to me is i already pay a lot for insurance plan don't ask me to buy another insurance plan yeah so it's like that i mean if you don't plan probably that will be the situation that you may end up with yeah I'm buying more of the endowment the savings plan uh, yep. rather than really pure protection plans lah. Yep. are they very specific uh, coverage that usually they uh, lack of what kind um, of uh, uh, is it hospitalization is it critical illness is it death is there a very specific area where usually they are always under insured okay I, I believe uh Probably the, the client that I face, they, they are also quite, uh, has certain knowledge uh, because most of them are actually from Dr. Wealth or those that attend my, my webinar. So they, they more or less know that the important of having a hospitalization insurance. Okay, So I can tell about 80, 90% when I meet them, they should have that. Okay, unless they are just graduate from school. Uh. Okay, What they usually let off is those death coverage, uh, critical illness coverage. And some even don't have those early critical illness coverage. Right. So, uh, of course, how much is sufficient is really depending on individual. Uh, I cannot say you must get 1 million coverage. Okay. We should not use that kind of, uh, we cannot plug the number from the sky to tell that hey, you need this coverage. Okay. We should do a proper planning to see uh, how much you need to protect based on how much you spend and how much you earn. Right. So, that is why the financial planning is important to get a, when you do the insurance planning. Okay. Mm. okay. So, a few tips here and there. So, we please remember. Uh, make sure your coverage is enough. Don't buy too much investment related kind of savings related for your beneficiaries to know, right? Let's move on to the third one. Okay, the third one that I can think of is ah, we invest without any strategy. <laughs> it's also one of the very common ones. Okay, because when I do financial planning or financial review, right? Uh, I don't just look at insurance. I don't. I don't just look at cash flow. I also look at the uh the, the investment they are holding. Okay, I usually will ask them, hey, can you? I mean, if you want me to help you to review your uh, investment, you must show what you have, right? So they just show to me. Okay, and then uh a lot of them actually show me a long list of probably stocks and probably some funds that they are holding. Okay, then my first question always to them is, hey, how you monitor so many counters or so many uh fund? Okay. And a lot of them, they say, no, I mean, last time I just bought this and the, the, the advisor told me to buy and I'll hold forever, right? Uh, it may be a best to buy at that time, but not now because the situation changed and maybe the company uh, uh, has not been performing. So you should always uh, review okay, whether is it uh, fit into your investment strategy. Okay. For example, last time you need a capital gain strategy. You go into those uh, stocks that with uh, more potential upside, but now probably you are more towards like uh, focusing on dividend income, then you should always uh, do some rebalancing uh, in, uh, in, uh, along the way, right? Uh, and also risk and return not aligned. Uh, this is what I uh, seen recently uh, during COVID-19 period. Uh, they probably they have used to, you know, we have a long bull run probably since financial crisis in 2009. So they thought that, oh, invest in stock always make money. Okay, invest in risk always make money. But until this year, much they start to feel the actual uh, so-called risk, the volatility in stock market, right? So uh, and a lot of them cannot take it. Okay, they start to liquidate their holding and at the probably the the wrong timing because it's probably at the bottom, right? So this is something that they don't have a proper strategy, they don't have proper planning, uh, and also they don't have any diversification in the so-called wealth accumulation strategy, right? Uh, stocks is one only consider one part of the asset. Okay, you should always consider like some gold, maybe bonds, maybe some uh, saving, right? So you should always diversify into different asset class, okay? So that you know 
this group of uh, this allocation, let's say to stocks, you must be able to absorb, I mean, accept the risk. If you cannot accept, if you invest too much in stock, then you should rebalance uh, to other asset class. Yeah. I mean, I also know this problem pretty well, right? Because we have done a lot of uh, educational uh, sessions and we hear their problems. And most of the time it's that they they don't have, even know their objective, right? Sometimes, right? Whether they are going more for capital gain or even for dividend, right? They, they don't even have objective and uh, likely they also won't know what is their risk tolerance. Sometimes they think that, oh, I can take a, a 30% drop, no problem. But when it happens, right, then yep. they realize they cannot. <laughs> so I guess that yep. is true experience. But um, uh, if we learn from all these uh, uh, mistakes, right, it's important not to repeat them. But I, I also feel that sometimes um, they didn't really gain any lessons from their previous uh, uh, mistakes, right? And they just yep. keep committing the same mistakes again and again. And, and they think that everything is fine, right? So I, I guess it's um, the... The hard part is to really face uh, our own mistakes, what we have committed in the past, and and really want to change uh, for for the better, right? Uh, and uh, that yeah. is part of the learning process, lah. Uh, just on this yeah. note, right? You mentioned about mm. the diversification. Um, yeah. Uh, do you think Singaporeans are underinvested or overinvested in stocks in general? Generally speaking. Uh, in general, I would say uh, under-invested. Okay. Uh, I can tell most people they buy property. <laughs> they have a lot of holding in property right? Uh, and less into stocks and also more into cash. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First, that's, that's what I gather from the uh, Singapore statistics as well, right? Like half of the mm -hmm. household net worth is in property and 20% in cash and another like what 17% yep. in CPF stocks and it's like less than five percent right so um why why do you okay property aside mm. because anyway most of singaporeans own their own homes right um given that they have more cash like four times more cash than uh stocks right why why do you think they ended up in this kind of allocation uh, is it because singaporeans yeah. are more risk averse or or they feel that they don't not confident about stock investing that's why they don't buy so much stocks I think got two uh, groups of investors that I can think of. Okay. Uh, one is uh, those that will never talk about stock market, who have no interest in investment. Then naturally, they'll hold uh, more cash. Okay. They probably buy some stock, a few stock, maybe some blue chip uh, or maybe some funds. Then they just leave it there. Right? So that is first group. Uh, they, don't, they are not interested in investment. They will just earn and save. Okay. The other group of people which they try to time the market, uh, they always thought that a hey, market is going to crash soon. Say they try to hold a lot of cash okay, and wait for market to crash. Uh, and unfortunately, on a, when you look back two months ago, uh, in uh, during mid March, that is actually the bottom of uh, this year. Okay, I can tell you that there are still people holding cash. They are still wait for the bottom to come. All right, even until today, they are still holding cash. They have been holding cash for for probably more than ten years because they are, they, are, they want to time the market and buy at lowest points. Which I think is very impossible, right? So my 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 suggestion is always to them is don't don't hold so much cash. You will never time the market right. Yeah, you can keep some, but you definitely don't want to keep a lot, okay? Because there is an opportunity cost for you to keep a lot of cash. Yeah. So this is why I see in a in a in a, in a market like for for more, uh what why most people are still holding a lot of cash. Okay. Okay. So actually, I can link hmm. it to the first point that you talk about, right? So the first point is using short term savings for long-term investment and when they are more, more probably more senior they got more savings right that's where they have long-term savings but they under invest right? so they have long-term yeah. saving but they don't want to do long-term investment so it's a, yeah. it's a really very ironic uh, kind of behavior right okay yeah so let's let's move on right to the fourth point Okay, the fourth point I can think of is ah, this one also very common. They okay, invest in products that they do not understand. Uh, I can see that uh, probably uh, now probably they are more more and more. I mean, people are more savvy. Okay, but in the past, I think probably early 20, 2000, uh, you have this kind of uh, investment link policy uh, that uh, very complex. Okay, I can tell you when I join industry when, the, when I join the industry when I read the investment link policy, where I see the term and condition, the charges here and there. Is very complex, and a lot of 
uh, a lot of my client or investor, when they come to me to bring me uh, investment link policies, show me, hey, can you help me to review this policy? Then I ask them, okay, so do you know what this policy is about? Then they say, oh, investment. No? Yeah, actually it's not it's just investment. It's an investment and protection, right? And if you look at the table, right? If you look at the table in this investment link policy, there is actually the cost of protection. Okay, and you actually put into a, a chart or table in Excel, you can draw the cost of protection. And the cost of protection will go exponentially. Okay, and this increase in cost of protection will eat into the investment value. Okay, and a lot of people thought that, hey, this investor, I just buy and hold, right? It's not true. Because if you don't need that kind of protection, you don't, should not continue the plan or reduce the coverage, right? So a lot of people, they don't understand. They just continue to buy into, I mean, contribute the premium. Then they just thought that, oh, it's an investment, right? Or they just thought it's a protection and they just don't, don't have to worry about that. Okay, uh, it, it's not true. Okay, that, that is the first thing. Okay, and also a lot of them show me uh, endowment plan, okay? Not say the endowment plan is totally a bad product, if you ask me. Okay, if you plan properly, uh, it, it still fit uh, a fit into your financial plan if you if you find a proper one, right? But when when they show to me, I actually ask them, do you know what is the return for this saving plan or endowment plan? Then they point to me, oh, 4.75%. No? That's not your return, right? That's 4.75% is the investment return from the insurance company. And that is a projected only, okay? Then say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, I don't know, I forget it. Or maybe the advisor told me, I don't know, right? So that is also the other problem. Okay, then when I look, uh, look, look at the proper calculation, uh, because I have the endowment calculator, right? I just show to them, hey, when I plug in all this number, I'll show what is the actual return you are getting. Then they say, ha, huh, so low. Uh. Oh, oh, now I know what is the return, right? So a lot of them, they have unknown return for endowment plan. That is the other issue, okay? And I ever uh, met with one client, okay? Uh, I don't want to mention the name. Uh, he showed me a, a endowment plan. He said for child education. They said, okay, yeah, I, I personally also bought child education plan for my daughter because there's a certainty of payout, right? Then I look at that, but I look at the plan. The plan maturity, maturity is 20, 20, 25 years. 25 years later matured. Then I asked, what is the age of your child? Huh? Or he said, uh, now two years old already. Then I calculate, it cannot be, right? <laughs> 25 years old later, right? 25 years later, right? The, and when the endowment plan matured, right? You get the money. But that is when your daughter reached age 27. Eh. It's like, graduated already right? then what you get this endowment for what is the purpose it's not for education purpose anymore right then you say oh yeah oh, why why i get into this plan huh? but i cannot help really because it's committed for a few years time uh if you surrender that will incur a huge loss yeah so i say i can't do anything right? you have committed this and without any uh proper planning that that is uh, one of the problem right yeah so that is actually linked to point number c right? okay product not suitable with a financial objective uh, if they don't plan properly, they may get into the wrong product or certain uh, product that's very complex until they don't even understand what they, they have. Yeah. So that's actually this what very common. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a confluence of factors why this happened, right? So one is could be a very, um, on the advisory side, right? Some, someone didn't recommend a suitable product based on the objective that were there. And, uh, to the point that maybe you know they they pop on the non guaranteed return of the endowment plan a lot more than the actual return of the policy, so that is probably on the uh, uh, advisory advisory issues, right? Do you also yeah. think that uh, as customers there must be some responsibility to play? Yeah, I, I totally how, how can yeah. uh, uh, customer themselves be better? How, uh, how can they yeah. how can they prevent from such things from happening? Because yes, yes, if yes, yes. we can't we can't probably control the other side, right? So yeah. the only way is yeah. Uh I guess uh proper uh learn from the uh pick up a financial knowledge, okay, uh from a financial education company, yeah, like Dr. Well, of course. <laughs> uh get yourself Thanks educated. for the plug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, get ourselves educated, okay? Uh, even for me, when I propose any so-called policy or plan to my client, I always educate them. Yeah, I always tell them, hey, this is how you calculate return. This is how you interpret the policy. I think this should be a uh, responsibility for uh, advisor. Okay, of course, I can't say for every advisor, right? But uh, if, if, if the, uh, other than advisor, of course, the client or the investor should also understand, okay? If they don't understand the product, don't invest, 
Okay, you can always come to us. You can always text me. Hey, can you interpret this policy for me? I'm more than happy to help you. All right. So, uh, yeah. And I think uh, in the past, of course, now COVID-19, uh, we don't see a lot of like root show, all this. Okay, but I can tell you uh, in the past, there are many plans sold or uh, purchased uh, through root show. Um, I can't really comment because I, I, I don't do root show at all because I, I don't think that should be the right thing to, to provide financial advice. Okay, but uh, we have still seen a lot of uh, uh, so-called advisor agent uh, doing that. Uh, I strongly encourage them uh, not not to sell product in root show. Okay, get financial planning uh, in the root show. That is fine. Okay, because when you do selling, you without getting a proper financial planning, then you may sell or something uh, that is not suitable for the client. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think compared to the past nowadays, there are a lot more uh, information online yep. and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of time to really just do a quick search, read a few sources and piece up a conclusion yourself, right? Um, probably yep. customers uh, themselves, they need to do a bit of work, lah, right? And don't just uh, solely uh, uh, give the trust to the advisor, uh, without without really knowing some of these uh, things and information that could be very important, right, and crucial to their decision. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah, just make use of a lot more resources. It may not be from Dr. Wealth. In fact, you should uh, even look uh, to more sources, right, rather than just from one source because yeah. online we also know um, there can be all sorts of views out there and it's always good to uh, read uh, more of them so that you can make a more balanced kind of uh, understanding of the situation, right? So yep. yeah, I think uh, customers also have a role to play, right? We cannot, we cannot just blame the advisors alone. Yeah, okay. I think I think that. And let's move on to the. Okay, let's move on to the last money problem. Uh yeah, actually there are more I just sum up to five. Uh, I think this is also very common one. No proper retirement planning. Okay. Uh, I can tell you, I'm, I'm when I meet up with a uh, investor, they always tell that hey, I have invest in store, I invest in fund. Okay, I, I save. Okay, I have done my planning. Okay, uh, that that is the most common answer I receive. Okay, but they have no idea about what is the CPF structure. Okay, how much they can take out from CPF, and also there are some you know uh, uh, arrangement you can do with CPF money. Okay, like transfer OASA, uh, increase to CPF line and uh, enhance retirement sums kind of thing to get better income. Okay, so these are some of the so-called proper retirement planning step that they should perform. Okay, rather than say, oh, I invest in stock, I bought some stock. Yeah, I am done my retirement planning, right? So, so that is uh, one of the most common answer received. And also, they have, uh, some of them actually quite late to start the retirement planning journey, okay? They always thought that, hey, I'm still young, see, I'm 20 plus, 30 plus, why I want to start now, okay? Uh, and I believe when you talk about retirement planning or financial planning, yeah, you should always uh, allocate some saving or some investment for long term. Okay, because you definitely don't won't use up everything for short term. That is for sure. Okay, if you use up everything for next fire, then what about the, the fire later? Right? So there's always certain portion of your capital is for long term purpose. Okay, and that portion for long term purpose, you should go into some uh the investment that is uh uh so called can uh, give you higher potential return because you have a longer term horizon to hold on to the investment. Okay, so that is why when we do retirement planning, we should always allocate uh, different uh, amount for different uh, purpose. Okay, and one part you should not ignore is retirement. Okay, you should always start from young and should always start to allocate some for retirement planning. Okay, and one more thing I find is the there is no well distribution uh, distribution strategy. Uh, this is I think very critical. Okay, uh, some of them actually invest a lot in stocks in funds okay or maybe some uh, uh plan or, or or contract okay or, or policy okay but they forget that at certain age in their lifetime they need to withdraw the capital the investment amount okay and there's uh, many ways for withdraw okay withdrawal you should withdraw uh maybe on a monthly basis to for your retirement uh, expense purpose right uh, but you should not put into those uh instrument that with very high volatility for withdrawal Okay, you cannot put everything in stocks, right? When you want to withdraw the money, because like in March, if you withdraw, you will lose out a lot. Okay, so we, they don't have proper well managed, well distribution strategy where they can get a probably a granted or consistent income stream, uh, for a retirement purpose. 
Okay, so that is a, a key missing part when most of them just talk about accumulation, but they never talk about distribution strategy. Okay. So are you referring more to uh, annuity plans for the distribution um, part? That is one of them. Of course, you should not put everything there. Uh, more into those that pay you uh, passive income, uh, granted income, or consistent income. Like annuity is one of them. Uh, bond is the other one, right? Uh, dividend stocks, yes, but then uh, not too much because dividend is not granted and uh, the value is subject to market fluctuation as well. Yeah. So, uh, and we learned that we should have a multiple layers of income. Uh. So you should have something which is considered as granted. Something in the middle, which is some we have some fluctuation, but uh, a potential higher return, and also some with uh, maybe some capital gain potential and probably more upside potential, right? So you should always plan the retirement or distribution strategy based on uh, multiple layers approach. Yeah, but I, I guess because uh, most people feel that uh, uh, the retirement is still far away, right? That uh, it's too early to think about the distribution. Let's focus on the accumulation. Uh, I mean, I also like this, right? So I, I'm guilty of this as well, that <laughs> I focus a lot more on accumulation, right? That distribution is like so far away, right? We will think about it when it comes. So I guess that is the, that's the human behavior part of it. Uh. Right. Yeah, I think, I think saying stuff from well accumulation, that is fine, but so, so have the planning to slowly uh, transfer or rebalance to a distribution strategy when we, when we will grow up, right? In age. Yeah. So, it's always like that. So that's why the planning is, is important. Yeah. So it is one of the reasons why Singaporeans are asset rich cash poor, correct? That leads to that. Yes, right? yes. Because if they actually yeah. plan a little bit properly and pay a bit more attention to wealth distribution, actually they may not be cash poor. They could utilize the asset to generate more cash flow from there. Okay. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, a lot like, like I think the earlier discussion we have is uh, a lot of them actually uh, invested in a property okay? and they mm. thought that property is a very good uh, uh, retirement strategy because they can get a monthly rental. Okay? But to be honest, I personally uh, also want to invest in property, but I look at the number when I calculate the detail in numbers, the yield for the property is actually not much. Right? Probably in the past years, but now the dividend, I mean, rental yield, after you minus all the expenses, actually it's not much. And then you tie up a lot of capital into one property and you just hope that that property can rent out. It's a lot of risk there, you know, right? So that is also one important thing that I, uh, I realized a lot of people do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. And uh, I think uh, Tatian, who is in our audience, uh, asked, yep. uh, not asked, mentioned a very interesting point. He said, are we facing overwhelming amount of information now instead? So, which means, uh, just now we talk about, uh, maybe the customer should also do some work and read up a little bit, right? So, Tate is saying yep. that, uh, we having too much information. So, do you have clients, right, that come to you after reading certain uh, online uh, comments and, and tell you that, oh, no, you see, this guy said this, I shouldn't buy this and that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this one definitely is one of the, uh, probably a problem that I, I see as well. Okay, a lot of people, they just Google around, say, hey, this person say that, this person say this is no good, this one no good. Uh, again, uh, if you really believe in financial planning, get a proper advice. Okay, it cannot, be, I mean, it may not be for me, that is fine, but get someone that you can trust, right? Get a proper advice. Okay, because whatever you, you read from internet, okay, uh, and even for certain like community, certain groups, whoever posted there, First thing, they may not have sufficient knowledge. Okay, or maybe they have. I don't know. Okay, but you don't even know the person that whether they have the knowledge or capacity that provide the advice for you. Okay, so you should not uh, act based on someone else uh, advice if you don't if you don't uh, understand the person, right? So uh, yeah, so overwhelming information that is very true. Okay, you Google around, you can see many many websites to give you the kind of information. Okay, that is why Doctor Bob come in to provide a proper uh, uh, step by step guide and also proper cost uh, for to learn, yeah. Okay, so I guess um, for the customer side, um, sometimes it's also that uh, if they don't go and do some research and blindly listening to, to uh, advisors, it's also not good because you never know whether the advisor is giving you sound advice. But if they go online, yeah. then they may, uh, you know, get into uh, ill advice uh, from anonymous yep. people that they don't even know. And how can you just blindly trust mm. them, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really not easy, right, for, for the men in the street. And there are a lot of things to 
to focus on in life, not just on the finances side, right? You have your yes, yes, you know, yes. being a parent, uh, sending your kids to school, you know, your your career development and things like this. So yeah. um uh it is, I, I start to get empathize, like, I start to really empathize that yes, uh, yes. Uh, at the end of the day is um, how much can they or how, what is their chance of finding someone who can trust, right? I think that is the crux of the issue, right? Yeah, if they can find yeah, um, a trustworthy uh, and competent uh, advisor, then that would be um, a big part of their problem solved, right? But even get to that point is difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, uh, get a proper financial education will help you to uh, find the right person to provide advice. Yeah, I mean, if you have uh, some basic knowledge about financial planning, well, me of your advisor, you know that whether they are telling you the truth or not, right? So I think that will help. And when you read online, you know that, hey, I mean, this person is telling something is wrong, right? So you, you, don't, you don't follow. Okay? So mm-hmm. I think that, that is a very important step. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it has to be a bit more uh be a healthy dose of skepticism, right? Not not totally yep. cynical that you no know, everything also wrong and not so gullible that everything also right. So there must be a yes. very healthy balance of skepticism, uh ask more questions, figure out more things along the way, and then you think a little bit, right, whether it makes sense mm. for yourself, right? So it does yep. still take some effort from the customer. And it's, you cannot just um, push all the blame to uh advisor himself or herself, right? Okay. Um, we we got more questions. Like um, uh, I think Rashmi was asking how to do investment in this market environment when so much volatility and what investment product. Okay, we can't be specific about investment product, and uh, I also will guess that Louis will say it depends on your risk appetite <laughs> and your objective. It cannot just be a broad brush kind yeah, of yeah, recommendation. Yeah, you know my answer. Yeah, yeah, you know but answer. uh, but maybe maybe you. Because, because this uh, person who asked this question, right, he's worried yep. about the volatility, okay? And just yep, now we yep. do talk about some capital guaranteed kind of uh, investment. But what yep. are some possible investment types that uh, somebody can consider if um, they don't need to play as safe as capital guaranteed? Maybe they can take a little bit of volatility, maybe 10%, 20% down, but not as much as stocks where you can go down by 50%. What are some of these types of investment that you can consider? Uh okay, I, I won't uh use the absolute percentage to, yep. to, to okay. tell whether uh, that insurance is over. But uh if you can mix up some bonds, uh some maybe saving plan together with equity, a, a balanced approach, I think that will give you overall risk appetite uh, risk level at the lower or medium side. Yeah. So it's just a mixture. Okay, for example, you can if you're a very uh, risk adverse investor, maybe you invest let's say twenty percent equity, fifty percent bond, and maybe the rest in saving. Okay, that will lower down your overall uh, risk. Okay, and you should expect the equity side will give you more volatility. Okay, but when you look at the whole things, you know that you are okay because you only have twenty percent high risk. Yeah, so mixing different asset class will help uh, in the investment approach. Yeah. Okay, on, on this point, right, we all know that uh, we should diversify by asset class, like don't have everything in stocks, have some in bonds, okay? So let's say someone yeah. uh, put money in like uh, 20% in stocks, 80% in bonds, right? Uh, you know what I realized, right, is that mm. they, they don't look at the entire portfolio return of volatility. They tend to narrow down and say, hey, you know, yeah. my stocks is losing 50%, but they don't remember yeah. that they actually only have 20% of the whole of their investment capital in, in stocks. But 80% is in bonds, which is okay, but they fail to see the forest, right? They just zoom into the trees and say, hey, I, yes, I, yes. And they get panicked. So uh, I, I don't know, is that a common problem you see among clients as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. I think you 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 remind me this uh this this uh problem, yeah. Because when I when I go through the financial planning with my client, right? Uh, and I, I actually, first thing I look at overall allocation first. Yeah, then I just ask the, the, the one with the highest allocation, okay, let's say uh, 50% in maybe land banking, okay? Example. Mm. Okay, and a lot, a lot of them say, oh, the one I bought many years ago, I don't care already. Okay, then I just focus on stocks. And then I look at the overall percentage on stock, maybe just 10%. And the land banking, maybe 30, 40%. Right? So my comment to them always is, Hey, you should focus on managing the land banking. Make sure that you the 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 the, the bank banking can merge, uh, get back the money, right? So so a lot of them they don't focus on big picture, right? Yeah. So that's so that one uh, issue as well. Yeah. So they major in minor things. 
right? Ah, rather right. than they spend a lot of time into something that they don't invest yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. like 80-20 principle, right? That uh, the mm. the one that uh, occupies the most in your portfolio should be the one where you spend most of your attention to, right? Right. So rather yeah. than rather than the other way around. <laughs> Okay, yeah. uh, let me see. Uh. Uh, Terry asks, what asset classes do you recommend for proper diversification in relation to growing your wealth in the long run? Okay, so because just now you also mentioned besides stocks, bonds, you mentioned also about gold. Okay, so yeah. which is actually quite controversial, right? Because not everybody agree uh, with gold. Mm. Right. So uh, since we are on this topic, what, what do you think is a proper diversification in your opinion? Uh, okay, I, I share my personal allocation. I think that, that will be the easiest. Uh. Okay, I have equity, I have bonds, I have gold, I have some fund as well. Uh, of course, I still have some cash. Uh. Okay, so my allocation is really depending on my view to the market. Okay, because I do some active management on my own. Uh. Okay, so currently I have a lot into equity okay, uh, because I can take risks okay, and I have a long horizon to grow my money. Okay, so equity is one of my uh, main allocation. Okay, I'm not sure about you, Terry, okay, because I, I don't know your risk appetite and your current situation. Okay, uh, but it's good to have some equity, some bond, and some gold. Uh, and gold, I tend to hold less than 5% of my overall portfolio. Uh, because if you look at historical return of gold, the compounding return for gold is probably 3%. Okay, of course, recently we see some, uh, a lot of gain, but if you compound for long term, actually about 3 plus percent. Okay, so uh, historically, equity, Compounded, compounded return actually higher than gold. So actually I hold more into equity than gold. Yeah. Okay. And um, Rashmi actually uh, expanded the question um, hmm. referring to investment for 10 years, right? Uh, and just now the question was about uh, the volatility in the market. Uh, so what can be invested? Okay. Um, and I think maybe I rephrase the question a little bit okay over here um hmm. if let's just like you mentioned having more bonds than stocks la, they will reduce the volatility as a whole in a yep. pound okay yep. uh, would you uh would you recommend one person on individual to uh, tendency la, to invest in say ets funds or individual stocks or bonds right what, what would your most common advice be for most people oh okay i think a lot of uh misconception about EDF and fund versus uh, stocks. Uh, fund and EDF can be stock as well, okay? Because it's, it's just buying a basket of stocks or bonds or maybe gold for you, okay? So fund and EDF itself is not asset class, okay? It's just a tool or instruments for you to expose to either bond, gold or stocks, okay? So ultimately you should still ask yourself, uh, do I want to actively select my bond or stocks or do I want to buy a basket of bond or stocks based on fund, a uh, true fund or true EDF, right? So that should be the question you ask yourself, not about uh, fund versus stocks. But fund can be stock as well. Yeah. So yeah. so let's say let's say they mm. have decided okay, fifty percent stocks, fifty percent bonds, right? Um, yeah. mm. uh, then now it's about the execution, which is the instrument selection period. Yeah. Right? So correct, correct. What would be your uh, what do you think would be suitable for most people? Will it be using uh, ETFs to build this 50-50 or funds to build this 50-50 or a mixture or what? Uh, okay, I will say in general, uh, of course, I'm a stockbroker. Okay, I, I, I am more on active management. Uh, but I can tell you for most people, the most suitable one should be through fund or ETF, not individual stock selection or individual bond selection. Yeah. Okay. Global or I, local? Yeah. Global uh, of course, or local. if you go through... If you go through fund or EDF, definitely go for global. La. I mean, since you are paying the management fee for either EDF or fund, why you want to go for local? Okay. Uh, and that is actually my actual my 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 uh, actual scenario last time. Uh, when actually uh, when I actually uh, do stock picking uh, in Singapore stocks, okay, and then also try to do dollar cost averaging through EDF. Okay, and the time I actually started with a uh, dollar cost averaging with SDI EDF, which is Singapore market. Then I just ask myself, hey, I'm actually selecting Singapore stock already. Why I still want to do EDF? Uh, Singapore EDF. Okay, why not? Since I'm doing EDF, why not I just go to global, right? Because I already have stocks, which is a uh, Singapore exposure, right? So that's why I always go for global when I'm using fund or EDF. Okay, so that's that's a good point as well, right? Because um, you have to look at the overall portfolio exposure, not just uh, individual investment. 
So um, probably you pick Singapore stocks, individual stocks, because you find that you are more familiar with them. But overseas stocks is mm. a, a bit harder, right? So you feel that you don't have the advantage. And that's how yes. you use ETFs or funds to get exposure to global stocks. Rather than buying a local ETF plus you put your own <laughs> Singapore stocks, right? Where you have yeah, been doing correct, it for a long time. Okay. Yeah. okay. So yeah. I guess that is also another common problem that most people, they, they tend to stovepipe, have a very stovepipe view of their investment rather than the overall picture. Okay. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, your uh, advisory business, uh, our friends at hmm. Policy Woke uh, asked, what yeah. is your strategy in growing and managing your clientele? Okay. Uh, Growing-wise, uh, it's definitely not easy right uh of course i do a lot of seminar and webinar so that actually helped me to increase my exposure to reach out to more people okay that's one uh, very effective way if you ask me okay of course we have i will meet uh personally to those that who want my advice that is for sure okay and it's all these are definitely true hard work lah. okay i actually spend almost every day even sunday i also meet people okay so that is how i grow okay of course I try not to just talk about products. I try not to push for those. That. I do financial planning for every single client. Okay, unless a person comes to me and say, I, I want to get this saving plan, can you compare them for me? Okay, that one is fine. Okay, but for most people, I always encourage them, hey, if you want me uh, to provide advice, I must know your situation, right? So through financial planning, I think they will benefit. They'll, they'll find that you are valuable and they'll definitely have some business with you. Okay, so that's how I grow. Uh, managing wise, uh, I do engage uh, an assistant, okay, in fact, two assistants uh, to help me to do some um, uh, reporting and uh, some admin things. Uh, right? And of course, I do keep an uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet uh, to, to, to remind me that hey, I need to review this person's uh, portfolio. Right? So it's all through a systematic step to do a, a monitoring and a managing client. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I guess probably um, some of the advisors out there, they face different problems, uh, right? And I think those who are uh, probably listening in, they are, they are not afraid of hard work, okay? And maybe their challenge is more of uh, how do I get enough clients to work hard also, okay? <laughs> in order for me to work hard to <laughs> enough people. Uh, and yeah. we know that there's a lot of stigma with uh, advisory, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you, you want to stand out and you want to be known for doing the right things for clients. and uh, But sometimes uh, lead generation can be a problem. Okay, So do you have any uh, tips yeah. on that? Okay. Uh, lead generation is not the problem from the first day you join. Even for me now, of course, less lead generation problem, but still a problem. Even for anyone is experienced enough, they will tell you lead generation is still a problem. Okay, uh, But I think through providing a uh, proper service uh, advice to your client, you will, de- you will get referral from the client. Okay? That will help you to generate a uh, so-called new uh, prospect. Lah. Okay? Uh, but for those who just started, of course, you don't, probably won't see a lot of referral. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to meet your friend or your relative because you must believe in, your, in yourself first. Okay? You must believe that you can do a good work for your friend, for a family member. That's why you want to meet them. Okay, you don't want them to meet someone else who is not capable uh, enough to provide advice. So you definitely have to meet them. You definitely have to tell them what you do. Okay, even eventually they don't like your service, it's fine. At least you you meet them. At least you tell them what you do, right? Yeah. So that, that is my advice. Uh, when you if you want to know how to grow your client base, yeah. So bottom line is always to give value, right? So uh, yes, yes. eventually, if you provide enough value, you'll come back to you. Okay. Just that maybe the reward is not immediate, uh, but it should come back to you if you consistently do that. Yep. Okay, Ken, um, I know there are still some questions, uh, but we are already one hour into the session, so we should not uh, drag further, but thank you for listening to us. And uh, Louis has uh, 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 recently created a new personal finance course. Okay, Maybe you want to share a little bit how it can benefit the audience. Yeah, okay. I think you probably can see uh, my slide. Okay, uh, together with Dr. Wealth, uh, I created this uh, personal finance master class. Okay, it's an online course. Okay, so like uh, some of the key problems that I shared in this uh, session, right? Uh, I actually uh, have a way to solve it. 
and that is through uh, learning a proper knowledge, right? So uh, we have created this course. Okay, you can go to this website. I mean, just go to Dr. Well, you look for personal finance class uh, and you can learn all these uh, knowledge, okay, like financial planning knowledge. Okay, what are the key things you can look at? Uh, risk pension, what are the insurance that you need to get? Okay, uh, investment, okay, how you can accumulate your wealth, right? And retirement, okay, once you accumulate your wealth, how you distribute your wealth. Okay, and last part, which is the most important part, is to sum up everything together, right? How to manage your portfolio uh, well, and also some case study. Okay, all these are uh, probably not real case study, but start uh, a case that probably very close to you. Okay, and a three case study in this uh, webinar. Okay, one is at age 30, one is at age 40, one is at age 50. Okay, so this, in, uh, this three case study actually will be very relevant to you okay, if you want to manage your, your, your wealth well, right? So you can go to this website uh, to sign up. Okay, we are giving 50% discount uh, for those that want to attend this course. Uh, it will be for lifetime purpose. Okay, so you can watch as many times as you want. And for those who have uh, children, you can share with them to learn as well because all these are like basic to, to uh, financial planning. Okay, and I think, right, uh, you know, we have this PSLE where those are uh, uh, exam uh, when you leave uh, school, right? I think this should be one of the, a course that you should take before you join into any workforce. Yeah, but unfortunately, we don't have any, right? Yeah. Okay, it's uh, it's uh, price is very very friendly. Okay, so you can just take a look, and uh, we really just want people to get this uh, part of the thing sorted out. Um, those who know us well, we most of the time we talk a lot more about uh, wealth accumulation, wealth accumulation strategies in detail. Okay, so uh, this is the more um, ground one uh, which are important, right? Before you even think about investment, uh, a lot of us probably don't even have figured out the, the personal finance planning, the insurance part uh, settled, okay? Because that should be more important than <laughs> investing your money, all right? So that's uh, the end of our session. And uh, we are aiming to do this once a week with different... Um, uh, uh, different guests okay so uh, we kicked off we try to do it regularly on a Monday evening right uh, for Louis we do it special because he couldn't do it on Monday <laughs> so we do it today and thank you for uh, spending your time with us and uh, hope that it has been helpful us to comment in the video and we'll try to uh, get back to you all right to answer some of these questions that you may have okay thank you Louis Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you, Alvin. Thank you for attending. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.